All right, guys, BLM here, back with a new video. And in this video, we're continuing on with my runner-up ranking series, and we're finally getting around to doing my runner-up ranking for International Survivor. Now, obviously, I've already done my Australian Survivor and my Survivor South Africa runner-up rankings. This list will be mixing them into one and also adding in the runners-up of the other English language seasons that weren't included in those lists. So the first two... Australian Survivor seasons that were before the most recent incarnation. We have the two seasons of Survivor UK and the two seasons of Survivor New Zealand. Now, I will not be including the runner-up from Survivor Africa Panama because I've not watched that season because it is not online. Also, when I say runner-up rankings here, this is essentially ranking every person that made it to Final Tribal. Now, the reason for that is because obviously, one, I don't really plan on doing a third placer list. And also, if you do, it becomes kind of arbitrary because there's also third placers that were not at Final Tribal. Plus, also, I just feel like everyone that made it to Final Tribal is kind of rankable within the same sort of list anyway, as they still played the same amount of game it's just more so a matter of like how many votes they got at the end but that out of the way we have 22 runners up to rank here so let's start off with the very bottom and i will say that the bottom tier here of runners up is pretty big for me i would consider half of the runners up that we're about to talk about as being a bottom tier runners up in the grand scheme of survivor but obviously within those tiers there are sub tiers as well and we're going to start off with the first two people we're going to be talking about being people that were voted out of the game and had to come back and this is a person that whose game i've already talked about in my australian survivor runner-up ranking but here at 22 at the very bottom we have tara from australian survivor 2017 and for me i just feel like she played a really terrible game overall i mean the thing is that she is within the initial majority on her tribe but then that tribe loses the majority but then her alliance loses the majority and she's quickly voted out immediately afterwards however she gets saved by the fact that the round that she got voted out just so happened to be when the exile twist happened that allowed her to swap tribes to the opposite tribe and in turn she becomes a power player on that tribe because of the position that she was put in where she becomes the swing boat. And then after that, there's another swap where, which greatly benefits her again, where she's able to take out her biggest rival in AK. And by the time the merge, she's essentially looked at as a goat. She's an easy person to take to the end and win against. But even then, she's not even within the core majority alliance where she's on the outs of the Henry vote and is proceeded to be left on the outs immediately after that into three to two to two to two vote and really just follows Lockie's lead throughout the majority of the game now she does flip against Lockie at the final six but again she's already in a losing position at that point at that point she's already never going to win the game plus also someone that just isn't respected both just due to her natural nature but also from the fact that she was already voted out she essentially becomes the kingmaker of the game where at the final four she decides to save Jericho and when Jericho wins final immunity he takes her to the end and she loses in what should have been an eight to one vote but she does gain the votes of Sarah and Peter largely due to Jericho's mistakes more so than things she actively did for me there's just very little positive to say about her game considering the fact that she was already voted out and had to return to the game she gets very lucky with the situations that she was put in with her doing very little of the legwork that actually got her into those positions then by the time she actually starts to make moves she's able to do so because of everyone's acknowledgement of the fact that she's never going to win the game so for me again like tara one of the worst runners up in the history of the show for me personally she's here at number 22 now at number 21 another runner up that was voted out and we're still with australian survivor but this is actually one that i haven't talked about yet and that is the runner-up of Celebrity Australian Survivor, and that is Justin. Now, Justin is actually someone that I actually think played a somewhat impressive game outside of the fact that he was voted out. I think if there were more people that had been voted out that were included within this ranking, he would still probably be at the top of the people that were voted out because I think he actually plays decently well. Now, again, he does get lucky with certain situations. I mean, he is the only guy on the women's tribe, and through that becomes a pretty central piece on that tribe as they don't want to get rid of him because they need him for challenge strength and because that he's able to be again well positioned very early on he gets swapped into a position that should have been beneficial to him where he does get swapped into a three to two majority however amber ends up flipping for 
some reason, again, this is a weird season where, again, celebrities, they're trying to prop up their image. It's not really like a standard game of Survivor, but still, she ends up flipping, I think mostly because she just didn't like Fiona, and I think part of that was, like, her trying to shape her image and everything, too. So, again, how much do you really fault him for that? I don't know. But either way, he ends up in the minority there, but then again, he's able to get David and Elton side with him to vote out Amber immediately afterwards, and is able to get to the merge from there. Again, that section of the game is kind of rocky where he is technically not in the majority, but there are some really weird circumstances to why he wasn't in the majority. And even then, even when Amber goes home, she votes for David over him. She thought she had Justin on her side. So really, he had no chance of going home there anyway. But then we get to the merge and he becomes a pretty central piece in the game at that point where he becomes one of the f- main figures within the women's alliance the the woman's alliance that ends up running the game at that point it's imogen nicole are a duo and then him and gabrielle are a duo and they're a four-person alliance. however they get to the final five where some wonkiness really starts to happen and essentially this is another weird again this is a celebrity season so obviously these people knew of each other at least but some of these people actually knew each other like justin and gabrielle were friends outside of the game and supposedly what ends up happening here is that there was some conspiring to share prize money from justin and through that justin gets called out on it and is promptly voted out immediately afterwards and again like this is a weird situation where like again he's voted out for something that to be honest wouldn't have occurred on the standard season if this was a normal season of survivor there would be no conspiracies about sharing money you wouldn't think at least i mean again like who knows with survivor nicaragua but still it's like typically that isn't a thing and also he was voted out because he had a relationship from outside of the game with Gabrielle, again, another aspect of it that's like, this wouldn't happen on a normal season of Survivor. So it's like, he gets voted out here, and you definitely still fault him for that. But it's a situation where it's like, there's definitely some wonkiness there. But he's voted out of the game, and after one round, he is able to return to the game through a challenge. And, I mean, this is some massive BS, but it's like, it's at the final three. Him and Guy are actually in Ponderosa. They're actually eating food and everything, but they get the chance at a challenge him and guy win they return to the game at the final three making it now a final five where they are two of the final five but again that's not a guaranteed win and this is something that i give justin a lot of credit for and really i think this is his best move the entire season is that he convinces imogen and nicole to vote out david which is a completely asinine move at the final five here given the numbers that they had he essentially gets Nicole and Imogen to throw away their games to get rid of David here. And that is something that's very impressive on his end. That's something that we actively see him do. We don't see Guy do anything when it comes to this situation. This is almost all Justin. And that's something I think you have to give him credit for. Immediately after this, though, again, like the rest of the game is just kind of wonky, where at the final four, Guy wins immunity. So Imogen and Nicole both vote for Justin. Justin and Guy vote for Nicole. Ends up being a tiebreaker. And for some reason, production decided to make the tiebreaker here a vote from the jury, where the jury votes out the person. And that's ridiculous, especially when Guy and Justin were, again, part of the jury earlier in this season. So he does get very lucky with that circumstance. But then he wins final immunity, gets the end against Guy, and ends up losing in a 3-2 to two vote. Where, again, he gets the votes to Imogen and Nicole, and he should have gotten Gabrielle's vote, and probably gets Gabrielle's vote if that situation with the money sharing and everything didn't occur. So, again, like, his game is just filled with a lot of weird circumstances that come from this being a celebrity season. I think outside of that, we look at his actual gameplay, I I do think he does have impressive moments. Again, that final five move is really, really impressive. The fact that he was able to survive his swap tribe despite him losing the numbers there. The fact that he is a pretty central figure within the woman's alliance come into the merge. Like, he does have impressive elements to his game, but again, the fact that he was voted out and came back into the game with a massive advantage is also not particularly great. And really is the massive thing that knocks him all the way down here to number 21. Now at number 20, we have a runner-up that I've already talked about. We're moving on to Survivor South Africa. The bottom-ranked runner-up there from Survivor South Africa champions, we have Boule. Now, I've talked about this already. Boule is someone that had no control throughout the entire game. She had no clue what was going on throughout the entire game. Never was part of the majority alliance, or at least within the core of the majority alliance. She literally starts off the game being a part of a trio that is on the outs and largely gets through those rounds through Kalarmi being 
a bigger threat than them, plus also Zan deciding to quit the game. <laughs> After that, she gets swapped into a pretty bad situation, but they never go to Tribal, and she ends up becoming, as part of that three, like an attachment to the Majority Alliance, and really just helps them gain control, only for her side to be blindsided immediately after that when Solly goes home. And eventually she loses Vel, and she becomes pretty much a lone wolf for the rest of the game from the final seven on. And really just isn't taken out because she's not a threat. She does side with Sivu at the point that Sivu uses his idol at the final five to take out Xavion. That's something I guess you can give her credit for, but again, I think you would give Sivu more credit for that. And really the only point in the game where she actively tries to make a move is at the final four where she tries to get rid of Sivu, but she even fails at that because she doesn't tell Graham about this plan. She just does this plan on her own. And because of that, Sivu and David go to a fire making challenge where Sivu wins. So she actively fails in the only move that she ever tries to pull off on the season. Again, she's someone that had no control within the game, had no agency for most of the game, and the only time she did have agency, she completely failed at what she was trying to do. So really, she is the worst runner-up that wasn't already voted out of the game. So for me, she has a pretty easy spot here at number 20. Now at number 19, another runner-up from Survivor South Africa, again, I already talked about him, and that is Doral. Now Doral was someone that very much like Boule had no real agency within the majority of the game, had no real control throughout the majority of the game. But I think the one thing Doral has above Boule is that Doral was at least included within the plans of the core majority alliance. Something Doral does very well is he's able to build a bond with Rob, the person who does dominate the entire season. And through that, he does have most of the information on what's going on. He does know who's going home during most rounds. I mean, yes, he's left out towards the end game, like when Jacques goes home, when Mike goes home. And really, he has no clue what's going on at the Final Five Tribal, where he does get saved by an idol. But even then, like, he's just, like, left bewildered at what's going on. But still, it's like, Doral was definitely a lot more of the core majority group than Boulay ever was on her season. Again, not saying Doral was good. Doral still played a very mediocre game and was someone that, wasn't respected by the end of the game and was never going to win a jury vote where Boule probably had more respect I think Boule had more of an opportunity to get jury votes than Doral ever did but for me I think Doral at least knowing what was going on through the game is what puts him above Boule for me personally so Doral lands here at number 19 now at number 18 we're on to a runner-up that I haven't talked about yet and that is one of the runners up from Survivor New Zealand Thailand here we have Tess who is the actual second place finisher. The person that came in third is actually much higher on the list than her. Now let's talk about Tess. Tess is someone that's pretty interesting because she is someone that was part of the majority alliance for the entire first half of the game. She was in this core alliance of her, Adam, Matt, Brad, and Josh that ran the initial tribe and they were able to blindside Keisha. After the swap, her tribe still remains within the numbers, takes out Liam, and is able to get to the merge with the numbers to take out Aaron. The problem is pretty much everything after that. From that point forward, she's never in the Majority Alliance ever again. Where she is blindsided when Brad goes home. Has no clue that's going to happen. She's blindsided when Renee goes home. Had no clue that was going to happen. She does vote out Eve, which, I mean, everyone voted out Eve, so I don't know how much credit you want to really give her there. But then even at the Matt vote, where they blindside Matt, she thought she was going home. Like, she thought she was going home. Both Adam and Matt vote for her thinking she's going home. And it's really through the grace of Lisa realizing that this is the time to make her move and get rid of Matt that Tess ends up staying in the game. And from that point forward, she wins the final two immunity challenges to get to the end of the game in a situation where she votes in the minority the next two times as well. When Adam goes home, she votes for Lisa. At the final four, probably the most damning thing here, she has immunity at the final four and still votes incorrectly in a two to one to one vote. It's kind of ridiculous that in the post merge, she votes for Dave four times out of the seven tribal councils they go to and she still ends up in the final three with him like she really plays a pretty abysmal game in that second half the only thing that's keeping her from the very very bottom is the fact that she was in the majority alliance for that first half of the game and she did actually get three jury votes from three people that were absolute locks for her again she was 100 always going to get renee adam and brad's votes and i think that's something you have to at least give her credit for but her strategic positioning in that back half of the game is so abysmal that i can't really credit her for much outside of that so because of that she lands here at number 18 
Now, number 17, back to a runner-up we've talked about. Back to Australian Survivor. We have the runner-up of Australian Survivor Champions. Versus Contenders 2, we have Baden. And there was a debate for me on, is Baden better or worse than Tess? And I think Tess is someone that was more part of the core group than Baden ever was on his season. Again, Tess was someone that was pretty much, along with Brad, running the game for the first half of the game. But the thing about Baden for me is that I don't think Baden has nearly as much of a drop-off as Tess does, where Baden is someone that like isn't part of the majority group very, very early on, but is able to survive long enough to where he becomes acclimated with people like a Sean, people like a Daisy, people like a John, people like a Harry, like these people that are higher up on the totem pole. And through that, is part of the core contenders group by the time they come into the merge. Obviously, after losing Andy, Sean, John, and Daisy, they're not put in a great position coming into the final seven. But that's where I think Baden's game kind of picks up. Now, I, I would give Harry a lot more of the credit here for the moves that happen here over Baden, but Baden was still involved in flipping over Luke and Abby to take out Simon at the final seven. And that group stays together till the final five, where he is exiled and doesn't really have any control over the final five round, but at the final four, they do successfully take out Luke, and he does win final immunity to get to the end. Again, for me, I just feel like Baden had more control in the back portion of that game than tested in the back portion of her game. Now, with that said, I don't think Baden had much control. I mean, it's not like Baden like dominated this game in any means. Like He still played a pretty mediocre game as a whole, in my eyes, especially because he didn't have the respect from the jury. Like There was no one he would sit against that would give him the win. Against Pia, he loses unanimously. Against Harry, I'm pretty sure he still loses unanimously. Against Luke, he loses unanimously. I don't think there's anyone that was willing to give him a vote at the end, and I think that's a massive flaw on his end, that he really just didn't didn't gain the respect of the jury. But to be fair, Tess also doesn't win in any scenario at the end either. Like while Tess does get three votes, that's never enough for her to win the game. Like literally every other person wins the game against Tess with the remaining four votes because she was never getting those other four votes. So while like, yeah, Tess can get three votes, like she was never in a winning position either. It's not like either of these players were winning the game. So for me, I just have more respect for how Baden got to the end than how Tess got to the end. Where again, Tess was completely clueless the entire way and had to win the final two immunities to get to the end even after she was clueless. Baden at least had more agency within the end of the game, knew what was going on at the end of the game. And while he didn't have full control over much at all throughout the game, he was at least more in the know. So for me, that's enough to put him here at number 17. Now, number 16, we're moving back to Survivor South Africa champions. The other runner-up from that season, we have Sivu. And I've mentioned this already in my Survivor South Africa runner-up ranking. I really like Sivu. I think Sivu is a really fun player. I think he's a better player than what this list makes him look like. But I think when we analyze his actual game, I mean, it's not that great. I mean, I think he has a good start. I think at the start of the game, he is able to integrate himself within the majority alliance while also playing the other side of the tribe as well, where he's able to build bonds with Boule, Solly, and Vel, while also, again, being part of that core with Shane and Marion. And that follows him into the swap as well, where he's still within that core when they take out people like a Steven and a Sonnet. So I think his pre-merge is very strong. The problem is his post-merge. His post-merge is pretty bad, where again, he's kind of in a similar spot to Tess at that point. I think he's a much more savvy player than Tess, but he's in a very similar situation where he's constantly outside of the majority group post-merge. Mind you, he is included in votes, which Tess rarely is. So I think that's another thing you have to give him credit for. I mean, he does try to vote out Graham. He fails at that. But at least he's involved in the Solly boot. He's involved in the Moira boot. He's involved in the Vel boot. Like, he's told about these plans. He's not just randomly voting people like Tess was. He is left out of the Shane boot, which is a massive knock for him, but is once again involved in the Altoff boot. He uses his idol successfully to take out Xavion, which, again, I don't love that he needed an idol that he shouldn't have had to begin with, but... I do think he makes the correct strategic move with it. But then also at the final four, I think you have to knock him for losing the loyalty of Boule. Again, like the fact that Boule tries to take out Sivu and fails, that's a massive knock on her end. But I think it's also a massive knock on Sivu's end that he wasn't able to keep her loyalty 
especially when Boule is someone that was extremely loyal for the rest of the game. So again, for me, like Sivu, I think played a very strong first half of the game, but just had a very, very mediocre second half from failing to get his target out, from needing to use an idol at the final five, from losing the trust of Boule. Like those are massive knocks for me. So because of that, he lands here at number 16. Now at number 15, another runner up I haven't talked about yet. We're actually moving on to Survivor UK. Season one, Pula Otiga, we have Jackie. And Jackie's game is someone that is so hard to assess for me personally, because Jackie is someone that was part of the majority group technically for the entire game, which is something that you can't say about some of the people that we're going to be talking about later. However, at the same time, she was part of majority alliance because no one liked her and everyone knew that they could take her to the end and beat her. And we see that happen in actuality, where she gets to the end and loses unanimously. So for me, that's a very tough thing to really wrap my head around because again, like I do give a lot of credit for people staying within the majority. I think that's something that is very integral within the game of Survivor. However, at the same time, when you're staying within the majority as a person that's destined to lose at the end, that is also a massive knock at the same time. So Jackie's game is pretty much the embodiment of that dichotomy there where she never wins in any scenario but along with Richard does end up dominating the game now obviously I give so much more credit to Richard than I ever would to Jackie as Richard was someone that would have beat her at the end and was actively trying to drag her to the end but again at least Jackie was in the know she knew who was going home she voted correctly at every single vote and was able to gain the loyalty of someone like a Richard who did run the game. So like those are like little things I would give her credit for. But at the same time, the fact that she was so detested by her cast and someone that no one wanted to vote for at the end is something that you do have to knock against her as well. But again, for me, at least she was within the majority for the entire game, unlike all the people we've already talked about. So for me, she lands here at number 15. Now, number 14 is someone that, to be honest, this was a massive debate for me. Is, is Jackie better or worse than this person? I decided worse, but I think there's a serious debate for that. We have the runner-up of Survivor South Africa, Philippines. We have Jean. And Jean is someone that I, I think when you assess her game, it's kind of a similar game to that of Jackie. I think she's someone that was part of the majority alliance for the majority of the game. However, unlike Jackie, I think she was always on the outskirts of that alliance. And she was always someone that the majority alliance was thinking like, okay, she'll be the first one to go when we come down to it. But then she was saved by the fact that Werner found out that Katinka and Annalise were plotting against them. And through that, Werner saves her. And then she wins the last two immunities to get herself to the end. She technically has a much rockier end game than someone like a Jackie who never faced any adversity because everyone was always going to take her to the end to beat her. Jean didn't have that. Jean actually had to fight her way to the end, only for her to also just lose against Tom, who was perceived to be one of the biggest goats in the history of Survivor. And the fact that she only gets one vote over Tom, I do think is a massive knock against Jean's game. However, I do think Jean definitely had more of a chance to win the game than Jackie ever did. Again, I don't think Jackie ever gets a jury vote against anybody. Not in a million years does Jackie get anywhere close to a win. I do think there's a chance for Jean. I, I do think there were potential votes there. I think Jean obviously does get the vote of Vusi. I think there's a chance in scenarios that she gets like Katinka's vote, that she gets Palessa and Shanae's vote. Like I, I think if Tom had been more abrasive in his final jury performance, I, I think there is a chance that Jean could have won that scenario. I also feel like there's other people within the game that Jean could have possibly beat if they had made it to the end. Like, I do think there are chances that Jean could have won the game that do put her above Jackie for me, where, again, I feel like they play very similar games as a whole of these people that were kind of being dragged along within the majority alliance, but were still in the know for the most part. And where Jean wasn't in the know in the like last few rounds of the game, which are massive knocks for her game, at least she had more winning equity there than someone like a Jackie. So because that, I end up squeaking her right above Jackie, but again, I think there's a serious debate here. I, I I could see the argument for her being lower. For me, she lands here number 14. Now number 13, we have another runner-up that's in a very similar tier to this. And we're going back to Survivor UK. We're actually wrapping up Survivor UK already. The runner-up of Survivor UK Season 2, Survivor UK Panama, we have Susanna. Susanna and Jackie are actually relatively similar in terms of how they were perceived within the game. Again, Susanna is someone that I don't think wins a jury vote against anybody. I find it very tough to believe that Susanna even gets one vote. Maybe if she's up against someone from the opposite tribe, 
she can get votes at the end, but I, I find it very tough for her to win a jury vote. I don't see how it happens, especially because the public was given one jury vote as well, and I don't think she was ever winning the public jury vote considering she was the most hated person on the cast for some reason. I don't think Susanna ever wins this season. However, I think she had a lot more control within the game than Jackie and John ever did. I mean, Susanna is part of the core three. Like, she is part of the three-person group that runs the entire season. Like, this is a season of Survivor that is solely dominated by that three in an unprecedented way, where there's literally no adversity for that group the entire way through. They literally just steamroll after they win the tiebreaker at the merge. And really, I just feel like Susanna had a lot more agency within the game than either of the two previous players, where she actively puts herself in the middle of her initial tribe very early on, first siding with Johnny and John, which she ends up running the game with, but also sides with Lee as well, and is able to become a central figure earlier on. Now, she does lose Lee before the merge, which does severely weaken her position, but the fact that she was in that position to begin with, I think is something that I would credit her with, especially over the last two people that we've talked about. But again, she ends up running the game with those other two. I think the biggest knock for her, though, is the fact that those other two were taking each other to the end over her. Despite her being the easy win, John was taking Johnny, Johnny was taking John. Like, they were both taking each other. Susanna essentially becomes the kingmaker when she wins final immunity, and she does end up taking Johnny to the end to give him the win, but... I think that's the biggest knock for her is the fact that she was going to the final three with two people that weren't going to take her to the end. But at the end of the day, she was definitely in control a lot more than any of the players that we've talked about so far. Plus also had some agency earlier on in the game that lands her above Jackie and Jean for me. So she lands here at number 13. Now at number 12, the top of the bottom tier for me is a runner-up that I again have a very tough time assessing, and it's one that we haven't talked about yet, but it's a runner-up from Survivor New Zealand, Nicaragua, we have Barb. And Barb is so tough for me to assess because Barb essentially dominates the game. Like, she runs the entire post-merge of that season, which I think inherently you would think, okay, then she should be very, very high. She should be in the top tier. The problem is, is that she was running the game to give the win to Avi. She was running the game so that she can allow the person she wanted to win to win. She doesn't try to actually win the game, which is something that, again, is very tough to wrap my head around on how, where she should rank. Because it's like, she, yes, she runs the game, but she doesn't do it to her own benefit. I think if she were running the game to try to get herself the win, she would obviously rank a lot higher. Like, even if she had lost at the end, if she had voted out Avi, voted out Tom, tried to get to the end with, like, a Nate and a Shay, two of the lesser respected people on the cast, like, then she would be a top-tier runner-up. The problem is that she actively goes against two of the biggest jury threats in the cast because she wanted to give them the win. And she just completely blows the opportunity that she was given. Now, again, like, do I think she ever wins a jury vote? Probably not. I mean, I, I, I like, there's a chance, I guess, but it, it is very tough for her to do so. But at the same time, that's also a knock against her and the fact that she was never going to win a jury vote. Then again, you can also bring up the fact that a lot of that's perception-based and the fact that she was this obviously like this grandma figure on the tribe and stereotyping that comes along with that. But I think once she makes the Sala move, which is the be one of the best moves of the season, the fact that she blindsides Sala, one of the biggest moves that allows her to run the game, the problem is that at that point she feels bad for Avi and she really just, again, pretty much just gives up her game to give Avi the win. To the point where she even votes out her closest ally in Nate to give Avi the win. So again, very tough game to assess, but I decided to put her in the bottom tier solely because she spends the majority of the game not even trying to win the game. So despite the dominance that she displayed, it wasn't dominance that was used in her best interest. So for me, she lands here at number 12. Now we're number 11. So we're finally reaching the middle tier of the list here. And we're starting it off with a player that I haven't actually talked about yet. And that is another player from Survivor New Zealand. And here we have Dave from Survivor New Zealand, Thailand. And now Dave is another one that for me is very tough to assess. I, whenever I think of Dave's game, I think of it as a better game than what it actually is when truly analyzing it. Because like I, I think of Dave's game and I think of him as a person who is very well positioned in the pre-merge, comes to the merge, loses his numbers, but then is able to reintegrate himself within the majority and run his way to the end from there. But I think if you actually look at how these things happen... I think you have to give him a lot less credit than that. 
the thing is, like, he is part of the majority very early on in the game in his initial tribe. However, he's not a centerpiece in the majority. People like a JT and an Aaron are much better positioned than he is to the point where he doesn't want Frankie to go home at the third round, but he's forced to do so because he doesn't have the numbers to flip it any other way. Then he comes into the swap where he's swapped into a pretty good position where partially due to his relationship with Matt, which that's a massive thing on this season is his relationship with Matt, which obviously greatly boons his game where he has someone else that's out there trying to protect him. But it also does knock him a bit on my ranking here as I do think that's a massive benefit for him that many other people weren't given. But at the swap, through his relationship with Matt, he's able to pacify the other side to the point where they're easily able to blindside Josh, which gives him a lot of leverage there. But then again, immediately after that, they go and take out Dylan, which I do think is a misstep on their end as it guarantees that they come down in numbers. And we see that Dave loses Aaron right off the bat and becomes the next target. However, this is where the Brad blindside happens. And I think this blindside would have happened no matter what, even if Dave wasn't friends with Matt. But I do think that definitely played a factor as well as obviously Matt was looking out for Dave at that point. But at the same time, Brad was just such a massive target at that point that I think they would have taken the opportunity anyway. The Rene vote is where it gets very questionable for me. I don't think he survives the Rene vote if he wasn't friends with Matt. I I think that's a situation where why are they keeping Dave in over Rene? It's still like a really weird choice if you don't understand the context of Dave and Matt's relationship. But that happens. Eve goes out next. I think that probably still would have happened. But again, that's something that he personally didn't want to happen. So can't really credit him too much for. And then we get the end game stretch where he flips against Matt. Again, really great move. But I would give more of the credit to Lisa as she was the one to fully orchestrate the move. And also, I don't even think that was fully in Dave's best interest at that point in the game. But from there on out, he's able to survive. I mean, he is deciding vote on the Adam vote. And then we get to the final four where we have that two to one, the one vote where I do think he gets kind of lucky. I mean, both him and Lisa get kind of lucky in the sense that Tara decides to quit the game essentially and allows Dave and Lisa to vote her out, which does save one of the two of them as where if that had not occurred, Tara would have essentially been deciding who gets voted out there or at least if they went to fire or not. And Dave would have been in massive trouble as again, Lisa and Tess would have voted for Dave. Dave would have voted for Lisa, and I'm inclined to think that Tara probably votes for Dave in that situation if she decides not to quit. So through that, Dave probably goes home there. So again, he gets lucky in another situation. So again, for me, I I feel like Dave is someone that, again, had control during certain parts of the game. But the question is, is, like, did that control come from his actual gameplay? Or was it handed to him because of his pregame relationship with Matt? But with that being said, though, like he technically, outside of the Aaron vote, voted correctly at every vote post-merge. And really, every vote he was at the entire season, he voted correctly outside of the Aaron vote. So it's like he was in the know. He did have some control at points. But I think he also got very, very lucky at points. And because of that, it's very tough for me to put him anywhere but the bottom of the middle tier here because there's just so many question marks with his game on how much of it was his actual skill. So for me, he does land here at number 11. Now at number 10, at number 10, we're moving on again with Survivor New Zealand, the final Survivor New Zealand runner-up here that we're going to be talking about, and that is the runner-up of Survivor New Zealand, Nicaragua. We have Tom. Now I think something that does affect Tom's game that you don't typically see on a standard season of Survivor is the pre-game, not necessarily in the sense of an all-star season, in the sense that they were like making deals before they were even flown out to the island. Here on Survivor New Zealand and Nicaragua, for some reason, they decided to allow the players to interact while at Ponderosa before the season started. And through that, Tom was able to build very blatant bonds with a lot of the people on the other tribe. People like a Mike and a Lee and a Jack. Like the people that he would later be aligned with later in the season when he got tribe swapped. But on his initial tribe, he kind of gets screwed over by that in the sense that he gets put on a tribe with all of the other people, essentially. And because of that, he's put in a pretty bad spot, but he's able to make it through because he builds a really strong bond with Avi. And Avi fights to keep him there all the way to the swap, where at the swap, he does flip. I mean, he does flip to the other side, though. I mean, he puts a vote on Mike anyway, just to keep up appearances. But then at the merge, he does fully show his loyalty and does lose out on that vote where Lee goes home and then followed by Mike going home. And 
he gets to the final eight, losing most of his numbers. Now, he is part of the solo blind side. He isn't like the main orchestrator of it, but he is part of it. But even without that, he actually goes on a pretty big immunity run. He wins five immunities over the course of the season for the remaining seven tribals that occur. Like, he's only not immune for two of them. But the thing that's kind of impressive about this is that he didn't really need those immunities to a degree. Now, the immunity at the solo boot is questionable. I think the solo boot still happens even if he doesn't win immunity, but there's definitely a chance he would probably go home there. And same thing with the jack boot. I think there's a chance he gets taken out there if he doesn't win immunity. But the remainder of the game is in his favor where Barb, at that point, decides that she's going to take Avi and Tom to the end. And I think you have to give some of the credit to Tom for getting Barb to be in that mindset. Mind you, Barb was always more pro Avi at the end of the day than Tom. But I think you still have to give Tom some credit for that. Plus also, Tom really leverages his relationship with Avi pretty well throughout the game. Again, the fact that he's able to build such a strong bond with Avi, someone who is essentially in a position to run the game, and gets Avi to really fight for him earlier on in the game, and really just use him in this end stretch of the game where during the Shannon boot and the Shea boot, he's able to get Avi to do two moves there that are not really in Avi's best interest, especially a Shea boot. I mean, for Avi to get rid of Shea makes no sense for Avi's game, but Tom is able to get him to do so. Mind you, also Tom forces his hand by winning immunity and leaving very few other options available, but still, I mean, like, I think Tom does a decent job in that portion of the game. However, I do think his biggest misstep is the rest of the game in the sense that he doesn't try to get Avi out. He has two more opportunities after that to get Avi out. His plan should have been to get Avi out, if he wanted to win, but he just never does that. And I think that's the biggest flaw of his game because I think if he does get Avi out, he more than likely does win a jury vote as long as he's not sitting against Mike at the end. So overall, I'm mean, like Tom, I think is a person that is probably a better player than his actual game displays. Because again, like I think his game is a game that is harmed initially due to some out of the game circumstances. He ends up siding with the wrong side at the merge that leaves him out of the majority initially but he's able to get back into the majority through the grace of Avi and really it's his relationship with Avi that really dictates his entire game and his management of that relationship is really what lands him as high as it is here at number 10. Now at number 9 we're moving back to Australian Survivor the only person on this list that's on here twice but we have the worst of her two games in my opinion and that is Sharn's game from Australian Survivor All-Stars. Now I think Sharn played a much lesser version of her original game on All-Stars here. Now, Sharn is always the type of player that is able to ride the middle. She's someone that's able to align with like the athletic crowd, but also align with the sort of like nerdier, less athletic crowd. Like I think she does a decent job at riding the middle, but I think the problem with her, especially on this season, is that she rides the middle way too much, where she doesn't ever fully commit to a side or at least if she does commit to a side, she doesn't fully let that side know that she's committed to them. And through that, that leaves like almost no one really trusting her outside of Moana, who had a pre-game relationship with her. People like a David and a Tarzan were always questioning Shard's motivations through the season, while people like a Brooke, a Shawnee, and AK that really wanted to work with her in the end game were left bitter towards her due to her not actually siding with them. I mean, Sharn is a naturally great player of Survivor. It's just that she has some fundamental flaws that she's not able to fix within either of her seasons. And I think this season of Australian Survivor All-Stars really displays her flaws a lot more blatantly. Where despite being very well positioned, like f throughout the entire game, she does so much work to position herself in a way that she's going to get to the end under almost any scenario. I mean, she gets to her perfect final three with David and Moana, two people who are both going to take her to the end. The problem is that along the way, she ruins her chances of winning the game when she gets to the end. Now, I do think luckily for her, she also had Moana in that final three, someone else that was just as bad at jury management as her. And I do think Moana is someone that she could have been at the end. Though even then, I don't think that's a guarantee. But I do think her allowing David to get as far as he did is one of the major knocks against their game. Plus also her burning so many jury votes along the way. Plus also just coming off as really wishy-washy throughout the game. Like at the point where Phoebe goes home, she first votes for Moana. Someone that she had a very strong pre-game relationship with. 
and then flips back to Phoebe immediately afterwards on the revote. She plays really scared during the Jackie vote, which just isn't a good look to the jury. Like, I, I do think Sean, again, does a very good job at getting to the end of the game, but does it in a way that doesn't gain the respect of the jury. So because of that, Sean lands here at number nine. Now at number eight, at number eight, we're moving back to Survivor South Africa. And we have the first runner up of the series. We have Jacinda from Survivor South Africa, Panama. And Jacinda is someone that, again, was part of the majority group for the entire season. I mean, yes, there was the Danielle vote where she didn't want that to happen, voted against Zane, but for the most part, she was within the majority group. She voted in the majority at almost every vote. The problem with Jacinda is one jury management. And really, when I say jury management, it really is Zane management. I, I think that's the main problem with her game. I, I think she just didn't get along with Zane, and that really blows up her game multiple times through the season. I mean, one, she loses her ally in Danielle and votes against Zane. That leaves Zane upset at her. Her initial plan was to go to the final three with Gareth and Zane. In that situation, it would have been great considering Zane was planning on taking Gareth to the end, and to first she was taking Gareth to the end as well, but that was the situation where she was going to lose. You also have the actual final five that happened after both Vanessa and MZ returned to the game where Zane right away decides to target Jacinda. And again, that's another problem for her. And it's by the grace of Vanessa and MZ realizing that they can take out Gareth with Jacinda's vote that she ends up staying in the game. But really, the biggest knock of all in relation to her relationship with Zane is that because she doesn't have Zane's jury vote, she can never win the game. The thing is, like, on the jury, she's always going to get the vote of Gareth and Lazelle. No matter who she's up against, she's always going to get those two votes. But she needs three. It's a five-person jury. She always needs three, and she can't get that third vote because she's never getting the votes of the opposite tribe, especially when against Zane or Gareth. Like, really, Lizelle is the only person that she could possibly be at the end. But she's also never getting Zane's vote, which is the deciding vote in all of these scenarios. And if she's sitting at the end against Zane, Zane wins with the votes of the opposition because he was closer to the opposition. So Jacinda had no winning scenario despite having a locked two votes on the jury. Again, very similar to someone like a Tess from earlier on. The p difference here for me with Jacinda is that Jacinda was at least in the majority for the entirety of the game. She was the second command to Gareth who did run the game. Again, this would have been essentially Tess if Brad had ended up running the entire season. Like that's essentially where Jacinda lands here. But also Jacinda showed the ability to be willing to take out Gareth when she needed to for self-preservation. Now, I don't think it was technically the correct strategic move in terms of positioning to get rid of Gareth at that point for her especially if she had thought the next few rounds would have been dictated by a vote like the other seasons of Survivor normally do. Now, they did end up being based on challenges, and through that, she gets to the final two in a situation where she shouldn't have, considering she was the very clear next boot at the final four. I mean, there's definitely flaws within her game, but the fact that she was, again, second command for a majority of the game and was willing to cut her number one when she needed to is enough for me to land her here at number eight, despite the massive flaws that she has. Now at number seven, we're still with Survivor South Africa. Here we have the runner-up of Survivor South Africa, Maldives. We have Let's Go. Biggest mistake of Let's Go's game is taking Heike to the end. She has this misguided notion in her head that Bonnie is going to beat her. And that stems from her thought of like, well, she would vote for Bonnie over Heike. Not realizing that the jury is very pro Heike and very anti-Bonnie. To the point where if she had gone to the end with Bonnie, she would have won pretty handily however she ends up taking Heike to the end and loses in an eight to three vote that's a massive massive knock against her. and really that's the fundamental flaw in her game because she again she wins in most other scenarios if she goes to the end against Bonnie she wins if she goes to the end against MXO who comes in fourth place she wins like she is in a much better position than Jacinda who like can't win a jury vote under any circumstance let's go can win it's just she actively picks the scenarios that doesn't get her the win like, if she had sided with MXO at the Final Four to get rid of Heike, and Heike goes home, she essentially wins the game at that point, where both Bonnie and MXO are taking her to the end, and she is taking herself, so she gets to the end against an opponent that she can beat. But she actively goes against that prospect and goes to the Final Three with a very, very strong duo. I think you also have to add in the fact that she was in danger at the Final Six. If she didn't have an idol there, she would have 
been at least in a tied vote, so that's not great. She was on the outs for the Dijon vote. She didn't know that was happening. That's not great. And really, before that, she was pretty much just the second command to Dijon. But again, the main thing that puts her above Jacinda for me is the fact that she could have won a jury vote, that she had winning scenarios, which Jacinda never did. So for me, let's go Lance here at number seven. Now at number six, we actually have already the final runner-up from a season that I haven't already talked about yet. And I'm actually surprised this person's this high. And that person is Shona from Australian Survivor 2002. Now, Shona is someone that is the definitive second command game. I think she played a very loyal second command game to Rob and gets to the end with him to where he beats her. I mean, it's pretty standard there. I think she's pretty much the baseline for a second command game on this list. The reservations I had, though, was... Is she truly a second command or is she just a straight up follower? Like, is she someone that worked with Rob to get to the end with Rob or is she someone that Rob just dragged to the end? I'm inclined to think it's the former, but to be honest, I think there's a debate for the other one as well. Like, we do see Rob going to her for advice on things. Like, we see that she is somewhat involved in the decision making, but at the same time, I do think Rob was the very clear head of that group to the point where it's like there is a debate for me again if it is the former then she lands in the bottom tier she probably lands right below barb but i decided that she is a second command i mean she to be fair i mean like even on the first vote that they go to rob decides to vote out jeff while shona decides to vote out jane like they're on different pages there and rob's side wins out there so i mean i to be honest that might be a major reason to think that she should be lower on the list but from that point forward i mean her and rob are in lockstep and i think she does a pretty good job at bonding with the people on the outside, especially Craig. I mean, she's someone that was very, very close to Craig to the point where Craig votes for her at the end. I mean, she does get two votes at the end. Mind you, that one vote being from Katie, who is very anti-Rob. But I think at the same time, I do think there's a chance that she could have won that jury vote. I, I think if Rob had performed a bit worse at Final Tribal, I think there's a chance that Shona could have gotten some more bitter jury votes. Also, outside of Rob, like I think Shona beats almost everyone else like i think shona definitely beats joel if she gets to the end of joel i think shona has a definite chance against katie sophie jane like i think she could easily get the jury votes of naomi and craig who are the two people on the outs plus also she would have rob's vote she would only need one more vote and i don't think that's out of the realm of possibility so it's like it's not like shona could never win a jury vote either and would only need the bank on a bitter jury it's like she could have won a vote if she was against anybody but Rob but the problem is inherently that she was trying to get to the end of Rob and she actively did things to get to the end of Rob which is a knock for her at the end of the day but I do think at the end of the day she is a pretty perfect second command figure within the game again like I struggle with like how much agency she actually had but I decided to still land her as a second command to Rob so she lands here at number six now at number five moving back to Australian Survivor this time we have Lee from Australian Survivor 2016. I mean, I talked about this in my Australian Survivor ranking, but I have a tough time assessing him at this point too because I debate on how much a second command he was. Because I used to have him ranked actually higher than this. Like he probably would have possibly even been my top runner up of Australian Survivor at one point. I think as time's gone on though, it becomes very clear to me that L was the center figure within that group where l was the one out in front she was the one that was getting the respect from the jury while lee was looked at as her second command if not even her goat and the jury was really just trying to find every possible way to not vote for lee and i think because of that that's obviously a massive knock against lee's game however he in my eyes he's still second command like he's a second command to l i think if he had owned up to his game i think there was a chance he could have won a jury vote plus also i think he does actually a pretty good job at building bonds with the people outside the majority we see him build a bond with evan that was pretty prominent early on the season and his, obviously his relationship with christy is very impressive to where he's the one that's keeping her in line now while l is really the one to take credit for a lot of what lee and l do with christy i feel like it's christy's relationship with lee that really keeps her in line at that point to the point where Christy is willing to go with Lee and L to the final three, which I, I think you have to give Lee some credit for. Especially in the fact that he gets to a final three scenario where he's guaranteed to make final two. The problem is, can he win? And obviously we see he can't. But again, like I think there is a chance for him to win if he had owned up to his game. 
So for me, he lands here at number five. Now at number four, we're going back to Survivor South Africa. And from season two of Survivor South Africa, we have Grant. And Grant is someone that, I mean, I've said this already. It's like, I, I struggle with how much he actually dominated the game. Like at this point, this top four, I, I do consider dominant runners up. These are in the top tier. However, with Grant, I think he's barely there, mainly because like, even though he is the one talking to the audience as if he's dominating the game, I think when you actually look at how the game played out it's like was he actually dominating the game though i do think he has control over that first round and really the second round on his tribe as well i think both of those votes are in his best interest and they are both involving him in the majority there however after the swap i mean i think the lisa boot is probably the big example of like did he actually have control there because like we get in the edit of him like saying he's willing to let her go but it's like it doesn't make sense for his game. Like, it's not something that would benefit his game. So I don't feel like he was fully in control there. We get into the merge where his tribe does win out in a tiebreaker challenge. And through that, his tribe gets the majority for the next few rounds until the final five where he gets flipped on by Manla and Lorette, where they take out his closest ally in Angie. And he gets very, very lucky in the fact that the final four is determined by a challenge where the person that comes in last place in the challenge is automatically eliminated, and through that, Manla gets eliminated, which puts him in a much better position as now he's Lorette's number one instead of Manla, which allows Lorette to win final immunity to take Grant to the end, where he loses to Lorette in a 3-2 to two vote, where he actually gets the votes of the two people he was working against the entire game in Amanda and Angela while losing the vote of Angie, his closest ally throughout the entire game, which is a massive knock against his game for me. Again, like uh, it's tough to assess his game because I think he talks about his game as if he's the dominating figure. The show presents him to us as the dominating figure, but when you look at his actual game, he's not really the dominant figure. Like, he is very, very early on, and then I think you can debate it in the early merge, but Outside of that, there's definitely points where he doesn't get his way. And because of that, for me, he's the worst of the dominant runners-up for me personally. So he's here at number four. Now at number three, we're jumping back to Australian Survivor. The top-ranked Australian Survivor runner-up for me is here at number three. And that is Sharn's game from Champions vs. Contenders 1. Now again, like Sharn, again, I, I think does a very good job in this season in the first half of the season. I, I think really up until Matt Rogers' boot. So really like almost like the first two-thirds of the season. I think she plays very well up until that point. I think she's a center figure within the majority group on the Champions tribe with her relationship with Moana and Matt Rogers. They pretty much dominate the early section of that game. She gets swapped into a very bad position but her and Lydia are able to flip over Robbie and Benji and able to get control on that tribe as well. Again, very impressive work from Sharn. Coming to the merge, she essentially becomes Matt Rogers, I don't know, second in command, because technically that'll be Steve, but I guess third in command or like co second in command, but whatever. Like she's working with Matt Rogers to dominate the early merge until Matt Rogers loses control and Matt Rogers gets voted out the final nine and Sharn obviously has that massive misstep where everyone knows she has an idol so she almost plays it for Matt Rogers but Benji convinces her not to just for Matt Rogers to go home terrible look for her and really ends up costing her the game at the end where Matt Rogers doesn't vote for her because of that move at the final eight she is directly being targeted and is saved by Brian and Monica flipping back next up Steve is a bigger target in her so Steve goes home but then at the final six she needs an idol to survive the final six round, which she does use successfully. So some credit for that, but also a knock against her for needing an idol. At the final five, it's her and Shane that do flip Shawnee against Monica. Again, I think you have to give her some credit for that. And then at the final four, her and Shane again trick Shawnee into doing a two to one to one vote when she was directly being targeted by Brian. Again, another pretty good move on her end. And then she wins final immunity and makes a really poor decision taking Shane to the end where Shane ends up beating in her 5-4 to four vote when she would have easily beat Brian, possibly unanimously. So, I mean, again, like, there's highs and there's lows. It's a very rocky game. Obviously, the highs outweigh the lows for me. Again, like, her first, like, two-thirds of the game, I think, is very, very strong. I think some elements of her end game, specifically her dealing with Shawnee, I, I think is pretty strong. But she has the points where she's out of the majority. She has the points where she needs that idol. She has the point where she makes the wrong decision at the end. Plus, also, her final tribal performance is so terrible to the point where she loses jury votes enough to lose the game when she came into that final tribal, supposedly having five locked jury votes enough to win. So, again, Sharn 
messy, messy game, but one that has so many highs that she still lands here at number three. And now the top two, and the top two are both from Survivor South Africa. They're the top two in my Survivor South Africa runner-up ranking. Ray talked about them, but let's run through it again. At number two, we do have Nicole Capper, the runner-up of Survivor South Africa Island of Secrets. And this was tough, actually, because I debated on Sharn being higher. And the main reason Nicole is higher here is because Nicole was in the majority for the entirety of the game. Again, Sharn loses control at the final nine and barely even recovers it towards the end game. But, but even then, it was with an idle play being necessary to get the numbers close enough to where that was able to happen. So, again, it's a very wonky road for Sharn. While I feel like Nicole straight up just has the numbers the entire way through, she pretty much dictates who gets the majority the entire way through where she is a pretty central figure within the game the entire way through where she's able to align with so many people that she has so many options within the game the problem is that because of how many options she has and the fact that she ends up burning almost all of those options she ends up burning jury votes along the way with people like a Meryl a Jeffrey a Cipe even Cobus to a degree though Cobus does still end up voting for her like she burns these people in a way that loses her respect from the jury especially with her deciding to go to the end with Rob, who ends up dominating the entirety of the game. And despite her having an opportunity to blindside him, she decides to not take that opportunity. Now again, the question is, is she a second command or is she a dominant figure? I decide to land her as a dominant figure because it's not like she's in the second command position to Rob the entire time. Like while she ends up in that position at the end of the season, throughout most of the season, she's working on her own to maneuver herself through the game. She's building a lot of these bonds that puts her in that center position for a lot of the game. Even earlier on in the game, she makes a secret deal with Paul and is able to manipulate Paul to give his idol to Rob. Like, I mean, she does things throughout this game that is very, very impressive. The problem is I, I think she backsteps at the end of the game by just allowing Rob to take her to the end. Plus also burning so many jury votes along the road. But even then, at the end of the game, she almost wins. The fact that Rob, one of the most dominant players in the history of Survivor, almost loses in a six to four vote is insane like she gets the votes of Cipe, of Jacques, of Cobus, of Steffi these people that she's really burned yet they're still willing to vote for her the problem is that she couldn't get some other integral votes like Jeffrey and Merrill to also vote for her as well so again like I, I think Nicole again has some very very strong positives in her game but also some lows but I feel like the fact that she was still in the majority lines throughout the entirety of the game is enough for me to land her here above Sharn and put her at number two. Now at number one, the strongest runner-up in international Survivor history for me personally and also in Survivor South Africa history is Ashley Hayden. Not a big surprise if you've watched my videos or I've talked about her game. Again, I think she played a straight-up pretty dominant game the entire way through. I think the biggest flaw for Ashley Hayden is that she makes one massive critical mistake at the very end. I think outside of that, her game is near flawless. I mean, I think right off the bat on her initial tribe, she is the center voice within that tribe. Like, I won't say she's the leader because she's not outwardly being looked at as the leader. I think probably someone like a low is more so being looked at as the leader, but she is definitely someone that is very integral within the decision making within that group. We see her being one of the main strategists of that group and is never really in danger coming into the merge. At the merge, we have a tied vote initially and her tribe ends up winning the tiebreaker challenge. But then after that, due to Isaac being Isaac, he causes another tie at the final nine for some reason. And Lo ends up going home because of previous votes. But then she's able to get Isaac to go back to her side and in turn take out Oker at the final eight. But really that final nine round is really the only time the entire game that she's out of the loop on anything like she, the rest of the game pretty much like from the final seven on the entire game is her like she's the only person actively making moves it feels like and obviously some of that could be the editing but at the gist vote something she does very well she's able to manipulate the tiebreaker rules where she gets gg and Shade to put votes on kaz while proverb puts his vote on isaac which gives her a lot of leverage moving forward in terms of tiebreakers and we see that come to roost right away in the next round where 
Ashley goes and tells Gigi and Sade to put their vote on Isaac, while Ashley and Kaz throw their votes on the Gigi, while the other two put their votes on Sade to cause a 2-2-2-2 two to two to two tie, where in that situation, because of the one vote from the previous tribal, Isaac ends up going home in the tiebreaker. Again, a really next-level move in terms of strategic forethought, but at the same time, probably not the greatest move for her jury management, even though she does end up getting Isaac's vote at the end. Next up, she goes and blindsides Kaz, her closest ally throughout the entirety of the game which is a good move in terms of positioning the problem is her execution of it i do think she falters a bit in terms of jury management in the way that she approaches this boot but at the end of the day it's like i think kaz is just the type of person that's pretty much always going to be bitter and then she's able to get gg and the final four to flip against sade take out sade and get herself into a pretty perfect final three scenario of her gg and proverb where both proverb and gg are taking her to the end and she still has a winning situation. I mean, in her mind, she thinks she wins against everybody, but in reality, she probably only wins against Proverb. And that's where she makes the massive mistake of voting up Proverb over Gigi. I've talked about this in the past. It's a ridiculous vote here in my eyes. Again, when Gigi has four people from her original tribe on the jury on a season where tribal lines were very, very solid right away, like it's insane to me that she thinks she can beat Gigi. When again, Gigi only needs one more vote and she knows that Kaz is bitter against her. It's insane that she does this. I think it's really a terrible move. But just everything else within her game is so masterfully executed that I still think she lands here at number one. Now, again, like eventually down the road, I'm probably going to do a global survivor runner up ranking. And will she be number one on that? Probably not. But. When it comes to the field of people that we're talking about, I think she's very clearly the best of the bunch. Really just has that one massive, massive flaw that harms her game and really causes her to lose at the very end. But outside of that one move, I think she played a near flawless game of Survivor, so she lands here at number one. And there we go. I mean, that is my runner-up ranking for International Survivor. Now, as I said, I would like to do a global one down the road, not coming anytime soon. I mean, it'll probably take forever to make. And to be honest, it's not a massive priority right now, but I definitely want to do that sometime down the road. But this is also kind of the end of my runner-up series. Now, I did plan on doing an Amazing Race runner-up ranking, and I probably will still do it at some point. But, but again, at this current point, not really something that I feel like I need to do right away, but something that's definitely in the cards for down the road. But for now, though, that is my International Survivor runner-up ranking. Thank you for watching.